Now, as I mentioned in my email, we have a switch in speakers today. Dr. Kamal Masaki for Dr. Morris, who had a conflict, and he'll speak next week. And I'm always delighted to welcome Kamal, a regular speaker in the mini med school, and also a very popular one. Today, she will speak about hospital stays. Now, I was the one who added get out quickly <laughs> for two reasons. Getting out means you survived, okay? And two, because my very first job, real job, 50 years ago, was in a hospital, and I was a medical detective. My job was to determine how hospital-acquired infections were happening. And, of course, these have gotten much more frequent and much more serious with the antibiotic resistance. Uh, so even the best of hospitals struggle to reduce this problem. However, we're really fortunate to have great hospitals when we need treatment, and Kamal will delve, in, delve into the special considerations for seniors. So please welcome our favorite geriatrician, Kamal. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much. Thank you, Joe, for doing our audiovisual. Joe hooked me up to this device. I feel like I'm going to get electric convulsive therapy at any moment. <laughs> so if I suddenly seize, you'll know why. So I have my topic today is hospital stays, to get treated and then to get out quickly. Now, all of us know that hospitals can be life-saving, and there are times when we really need to be there. But, as Virginia said, there are a lot of hazards also associated with the hospital. So today's learning objectives, we want to learn why older people are more prone to complications in the hospital, how to prevent these complications. I want to really focus on the hazards of bed rest. Bed rest is really, really bad for all of us, but particularly for older people. Talk about why older people are more susceptible to adverse drug events, and then talk about some new models of care in the country. We don't have many of those here in Hawaii, but maybe we will in the future. So this slide just shows you how older people use up a disproportionate share of hospital resources. So the first bar is the general population. So you can see the bottom, the darker blue, is the people who are 65 years and over. So it's not a huge percentage, it's somewhere between 10 and 20 percent. But when we look at people in the hospital, it's a much larger percentage. That's the second bar. And when we look at hospital spending, that's the third bar, you can see those 65 and older account for about half the costs. The reason is older people tend to stay longer in the hospital and tend to have more expensive hospitalizations. That means more complicated hospitalizations. So that's really common. This is a quote from one of my mentors, Dr. David Rubin, who's the chair of geriatrics at UCLA. And he, he published this in the Journal of the American Geriatric Society. Hospitalizations are landmark events in the lives of older persons and frequently mark the transition from health to frailty. And I think this is definitely true. So once people are hospitalized, older people are more likely to lose their independence or to be placed in an institution. If you look at the people over the age of 70 who are in the hospital, one third will leave with a new disability. Recovery can be very slow. It can take up to two years. Most of the recovery, though, happens in the first six months, so we can kind of predict what that person is going to be able to do down the road. There are some risk factors for having worse outcomes for independence. Advanced age, some of these are really common sense, right? You'd expect this. If you have previous disability and problems with mobility, your chances of acquiring a new problem are higher as well. Cognitive or memory problems or depression. You can imagine why, right? Somebody who has a memory problem, they won't be able to cooperate with medical treatment, with rehabilitation, because they just don't remember. Or somebody who's very depressed may not do it because they just don't have the motivation to do it. Poor nutrition is a bad predictor as well. And then the longer you stay in the hospital, that predicts how much worse you will do. So why are older people at risk? 
So we've got this young man on the top, probably young to middle-aged, and then we've got somebody frail on the bottom. Well, a young person tends to have a lot of reserve. This is in every organ system. The heart, the lungs, the kidneys, anything you mention, there's a lot of reserve. The human body is capable of withstanding a lot of insults. The reserve gets less as we get older. When you have an acute illness or a stress, you can see the young person, no problem, right? It's within their reserve, their body can adapt, and they can go on their way. You can see, in, even in the middle, that person is not going to recover very well. Now, you, when you have an older, frail person, their reserve is really low, and now that person is not going to be able to get up. It's just really hard to pick up when you have almost no reserve. There's an increase in disease burden with older age. These are some of the common reasons for hospitalization in old age. Congestive heart failure and pneumonia, those are the two that by far are either number one or number two diagnosis for Medicare, for reasons for hospitalization. They are the most common, and these patients often will come back repeatedly for the same diagnosis. Urinary and other infections, heart rhythm problems, heart attacks, emphysema, diabetes, stroke, and adverse drug events. So this is stuff that we are doing to people, right? Giving them medications. Now, some of those are predictable, some are not predictable. We want to at least avoid the predictable ones. So now we have an older person who has decreased reserve and more disease burden. And both of these lead to age-related morbidity and disability. Now, we add on a hospital admission. With all of those additional stresses, this can lead to disaster. And what we want to do is avoid that as much as possible. So when we look at an older person, on the left is the hospital, on the right is home. We want to get them safely across that tightrope. But there are a lot of things that are in the way. Sleep, hearing and vision, delirium, falls, depression, pain, malnutrition, catheter use, infections, pressure ulcers, environment, medications. <laughs> you have to navigate all of those things on the way home. So on admission, when we assess people, the first thing we want to know is what is their baseline? Not since they got sick, before they got sick. So let's say somebody's been sick for three days. We want to know before that, what was their baseline? What were they able to do for themselves? Were they walking? Were they able to dress and bathe and groom themselves, feed themselves, that kind of thing? Obviously, we're never going to get somebody better than their baseline, right? But the target is always want to get them back to their baseline. What is the social situation? Is the person living alone? Who helps them? Older people who are living alone, from the very moment of admission, people should be starting to look at them to see, is that a feasible option to have them go back home alone after this hospitalization? What is the baseline cognitive status? Those of you who've heard my dementia talk know that 50 to 75 percent of dementia is missed by doctors. Half to three quarters is missed. So many patients who come into the hospital, they don't carry a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease or another dementia, but they might have it. It might be very mild, but they might have it. And the hospitalization might uncover it, because suddenly there's no reserve left, right? So that person might show suddenly that they have problems. Home medications, what were they taking? Were they actually taking it? So this is a common scenario that happens. Somebody is seeing their doctor for high blood pressure. They're given a prescription. Doctor sees them again. High blood pressure is still high. They add a second medication. Come back, high blood pressure is still high. Maybe they add a third medication. Now they come into the hospital. They have that list of medications, right? They're taking these three medications for blood pressure. 
except they're not taking it. They're not taking any of them. That's why their high blood pressure has remained high. Now we give them those three blood medications thinking they're taking it at home. Guess what happens? They crash. So it's really important to know, are you actually taking the medications that's on your prescription list? Advanced directives and polls, I'll talk about that in a couple of slides. And what is the role of the hospitalist? So if you remember, even 10, 20 years ago, when you, you saw your primary physician, if you ever needed hospitalization, they're the ones who admitted you to the hospital. They discharged you. They saw you again in the office. Continuity of care. The same person is seeing you. They remember what happened to you last week in the hospital. Now, we have hospitalists. So your primary care physician most likely will not admit you. They will refer you to a hospitalist who's a specialist who stays in the hospital all day, every day. That's all they do. Good in some ways, because the more you do something, the better you become at it. I'll give you an example, ICU medicine. I used to be able to do that. I haven't admitted a patient to the ICU for over 20 years. I'm not going to be good at it now. It would be malpractice for me to do it now, right? Because things have changed so much. So it's good to have somebody who's really doing it every day to do it. But the, the bottom, the downside is that that person doesn't know you. They don't know your family, and things can slip through the cracks. My geriatric medicine fellows this year, we're doing a project. We're looking at admission to nursing homes. The patient comes over from the hospital with five medication lists, different types, one on the discharge summary, one on something else, one on another piece of paper. When we look at those five pieces of paper, not, they don't match. So now the nurses are left with five pieces of paper. Which one is the accurate one? It takes hours to figure it out, and you can imagine a lot of errors happen along the way. So we're actually approaching the hospitals with some results of our pro... It's a small project, it's about less than 20 patients, but we showed them, in these 20 patients, look at the percentage of errors that could have happened or that did happen. Can we please have one accurate piece of paper and not five inaccurate pieces of paper? We're working on it. We're hoping that this will change things. Goals of care. It's really important for patients to have a say in what happens to them, right? Patient autonomy is really the core of medical care. Now, goals can really vary. Some older persons will say, do everything you can to prolong my life as long as possible, even if it means being put on machines. I would say in my experience with older patients, the vast majority will tell me I've had a great life. When my time comes, if there's good chance for recovery to where I have good quality of life and function, then fine, but if not, please just keep me comfortable. So that's what we as physicians need to find out. What is our patient's philosophy? How can we respect that and give them what they want? Is ICU care okay? I often ask patients that. Because in the ICU, a lot of invasive and painful things are going to happen to you. That's just the nature of ICU care. Some say no. If I'm that sick, again, just keep me comfortable. Just because we can do something doesn't mean we should do it. I think our technology has kind of outstripped the ethics. And sometimes there are real dilemmas about what we should or should not be doing. So I think it's important for everyone to share your goals of care with your family and with your physicians. I really want to stress the sharing with your family. I've had patients who've shared it with me, but they haven't talked to their family about it. I have lots of documentation in my chart about conversations we've had. The family said, mom or dad never even told me, never talked to me about this. It's really important that they know what your feelings are. I hope everyone has an advanced healthcare directive. This is what we used to call a living will. Now the state changed it to an advanced healthcare directive. How many of you have one? Can I see a show of hands? Okay. Again, it should be regardless of age. I made my first one at the age of 28 when I joined the Geriatric Medicine Fellowship because I could see the things that could happen and I wanted to make sure that they did not happen to me. 
So I wanted to make sure that if I had some catastrophic event, that I would not be put on machines and things like that. So that was my philosophy. The POLST stands for Physician or Provider Orders for Life-Sustaining Treatment. And I've put a copy of the top of the form there. It's in this bright fluorescent green color. And that's purposely, they chose that color so that it's easy to find. If it's buried in papers, you can see that form very easily. I recommend this not be put into your safety deposit box or in a drawer. This actually should be on your refrigerator or on the back of the front door or somewhere where people can see it. Because when the paramedics come to your house, they will follow these orders. It's like a physician order that they will follow. And make sure your doctor has copies or your hospital has copies of all of these documents. Bed rest. Some people say, you know, I really need to rest. Well, bed rest is really, really bad for us. So even if somebody, say, has a fracture in their spine and it hurts to move, it's very important to get that person up and moving, even if we have to treat the pain to do that. Because these are some of the consequences of bed rest. Muscle strength decreases by 5% per day. Bone loss from 10 days of bed rest takes four months to restore. It's easy to lose. It's not easy to regain. You can get contractures in the muscles. Sometimes these can be permanent contractures. So if I have a contracture, I won't be able to straighten out my joint. And as I said, sometimes those are permanent and can be quite painful. People can get blood clots in the legs, which can get serious, even life-threatening if they go to the lungs. You get weak, you can fall, you can get fractures, pressure sores, older people have thinner skin, loss of fat under the skin, and because of that, they're more prone to pressure ulcers as well. So it's really important, as soon as it's safe, to get somebody out of bed with help. So when we see people with mobility impairment, I've given the associated problems, and then what are the solutions? This can lead to deconditioning, falls, injuries, physical restraints. Have you seen that people being tied down? Now, sometimes that's unavoidable. If somebody has, let's say they're on a breathing machine, you don't want them to yank that tube out, and it can happen. So I can understand where sometimes we do need to restrain people for their own safety. But in general, I would say restraints are really bad and cause more problems than they help. People feel, if I restrain the person in bed, they won't get out of bed and fall. Restraints have been found to not decrease falls. If anything, they've been found to worsen the type of fall, because people can find a way out of the restraints, but in a very crazy way. So restraints need to be stopped unless they're absolutely necessary. Environmental hazards. Again, just to get from bed to the bathroom sometimes can be a problem. Imagine if somebody has an IV hanging or a catheter. There are a lot of tubes to trip over, right? Those are hazards that we have to watch out for. Urinary incontinence and pressure ulcers also happen because the person is in bed for very long. So the solutions are get the person out as quickly as possible. Have a call bell. Sit in the chair for meals. Lying in bed and eating meals is not a good thing. Try it sometime. It's really hard to do. Even you will choke, right? So it's better to have them sit up if they can. Assistance with toileting. One-to-one -one sitters are very helpful. And the hospitals, I'm, I'll tell you right now, none of the hospitals in Hawaii offer this. It's too expensive. They can't afford it. So if you can have family members take turns, just being with the person as much as possible. Having somebody at the bedside can really help the person. Physical therapy and occupational therapy as early as the person can cooperate. Assistive devices used correctly. I remember I had a patient who I, initially she was using a cane. And every time she would see me from across the room, she'd be lifting up her cane and waving it in the air like this. And I'd be calling out, please use your cane. And she'd say, I am using it. <laughs> I meant use your cane, you know, properly. <laughs> 
removing restraints, we talked about that, and then removing catheters, IVs, all of those things as quickly as possible. Now, pressure ulcers, this is what happens to your skin. They're also called bed sores. And this happens because the, th the fat layer in older persons and the skin is much thinner. So there's much less barrier between the bone and the bed. That's what causes pressure ulcers. It's rubbing, friction between those two. More padding is better, so if you have that fat layer, it's kind of protective, but if you don't, so people who are really thin are actually at higher risk. And on the bottom, I've got actually the points that are at higher risk. This is where the bone is very close to the skin. So you can see the high-risk elbow, you know, the shoulder, the elbow, the back of the head, the back, the bottom is really the hips, the heels, those are the places where most pressure ulcers will form. Problems that can be associated with, these can get infected, they can cause pain, functional decline, and if there's moisture, so again, think of the bottom, right? If somebody's incontinent in a diaper, that's going to make that area much more prone to having these. So the solutions are we need to catch these early, so check the skin every day, turn these patients frequently, and there are certain positions that the nurses know should be used. For example, never have somebody completely on their side. It's better to have them kind of partially on their side with a pillow wedge or something like that. Check those risk areas every day. Make sure the person has as good nutrition as possible. Make sure the person has a good mattress. Nowadays, I think most of the hospital beds have low-pressure mattresses already. Time toileting is critical to keep the area as dry as possible. So the key is really prevention. Once it forms, it takes a long time to heal. So we really want to prevent these if possible. What about sleep? Have any of you ever been hospitalized? Can you raise your hands? Okay. How was your sleep in the hospital? Non-existent sometimes, right? You can imagine why people get delirious. I was delirious in the hospital. I was young. I was delirious because I'd had no sleep for two nights. So it's really important. So I've had people tell me that. I need to go to the hospital to rest. <laughs> you are going to get no rest in the hospital. Hearing and vision problems are very common in older people. And again, if they don't have their hearing aids or their glasses, or if those get lost, which does happen, you can imagine why it compounds the problem. People get, get delirium, anxiety, and functional decline. So now, imagine you're an older person. Maybe your memory is so-so. Now you wake up in a strange place. Your glasses are not with you, so these blurry strangers are poking and prodding at you, doing things that cause you pain sometimes explaining, sometimes not even telling you what they're doing. Can you imagine what that would be like? That's what our older patients face. So in the environment, reducing noise and bright lights is really important to try and get as much sleep as possible. Some of the nursing homes have done this. They have this device in the nursing area. It looks like a traffic light. If it's green, that means their noise level is good. If it's yellow, it's like, you're talking too loud. And when it's red, it's like, stop it already, because it's disturbing all the patients. So they actually have that to remind the staff not to talk too loudly at night. For the staff, the night shift, that's their daytime, because they sleep all day. But the patients need to sleep, so they have to be more aware. So they're doing these traffic lights to kind of bring awareness to staff, to say, please keep it down at night. One-to-one -one sitters are really valuable. Again, nighttime is when people get most confused. They might get up to go to the bathroom, forget that they're supposed to call somebody and fall. So if they have a sitter, that can really help. Frequent reorientation with a calendar, a clock nearby that gives the person the right date, the right day, the right time. Make sure that people have some activity during the day. If you're lying in bed or even sleeping all day, you're going to be up all night. That's just normal. Hearing. Provide the hearing aids, speak slowly and clearly, make sure that simple things like earwax has been cleared away. 
so that you're optimizing hearing. And then make sure the vision is optimized as well. What about the bladder and the bowels? Urinary incontinence is really common in the hospital. It's associated with the underlying illness sometimes, often with access and restraints. If you're tied down in bed and you need to go to the bathroom, guess what? You're going to be incontinent. You have no way to go. So it's really important, again, to make sure that the person doesn't have that. And then waiting for the nurse. I've had a lot of patients tell me that. I keep ringing and ringing and ringing, and nobody comes. So it takes them a long time to come. And that is an issue. And that is something that I think the hospitals need to work on doing better. To be honest, for changing the patient, it doesn't need to be a nurse. It probably should be a nurse's aide who can do that. So we need to get better staffing for that. Catheters are often used. Catheters are horrible. You need them sometimes when you need very accurate measure of how much urine the person is making. You have to use a catheter, otherwise you don't get accurate readings. But if you don't need that, if it's just for convenience, please get it out. 100% of catheters over a period of time will get infected, 100%, if they left long enough. So take them out so you don't have that. Constipation can cause poor appetite, abdominal pain, can even contribute to delirium. So we need to make sure that the patient is moving their bowels regularly. So again, solutions. Are you noticing a common theme here? Get out of bed quickly. Get the catheter out. Time toileting is really important. This means that you don't wait for the person to ask you to go to the bathroom. Every two, usually we start with every two hours. It can be a little less, a little more if the patient has certain needs. Every two hours, the nurse or somebody should take the patient to the bathroom. Not ask, do you want to go? Say, it's time to go to the bathroom and just take them. Bedside commode can help. Less to walk before you get to the bathroom. Monitoring bowel movements, avoiding certain medications that can cause problems with bowel and bladder, and then giving laxatives if necessary. Nutrition is a huge issue for older people. Many people, many older people have malnutrition even before coming to the hospital. They're not eating well. One of the things that I find really ironic is an older person is losing weight, and often it's because they're trying to eat healthy. So it's, it's good in younger ages, you know, eating less fat and less sugar and less salt and, you know, keeping a very healthy diet. But in old age, I feel like weight loss is more serious than having even a marginal cholesterol or, or other things, other risk factors. Weight loss is really serious in older people. I jump on it immediately, because it often starts a spiral of going into frailty. So the first thing I do is liberalize the diet. It's like stop watching what you're eating, eat anything you want, but keep that weight on, because that's more important than anything else. Dehydration is also common in older people, even at baseline. Older people have a lower thirst response, so when they're out, maybe sweating, they will not get that thirst urge, and they will often get dehydrated. So both of these will increase the risk of complications. So, when we see older people who are losing weight, we need to look at lots of things. First of all, the mouth. Are they able to chew properly? Are their dentures fitting? If the dentures are loose, it's very hard to chew and swallow. So it's really important to make sure those get fixed. Are they having swallowing problems? Is the diet too restrictive? Maybe we need to loosen that up a little bit. Another thing is end-of-life care. When somebody's in hospice, Putting them on a low cholesterol diet is ridiculous, you know? Let them have as much chocolate ice cream as they want, you know? It's a matter of quality of life at that point. I've already put, I've already told my fellows, whoever's going to take care of me, if I have swallowing problems when I'm older, please do not put me on a pureed diet. I've already told them that. This happened to my mother-in-law. She had a stroke, she was in a nursing home, and she was losing weight. And I went and talked to her, and I said, Mom, you really got to try and eat more. And she happened to have a meal in front of her. And she said, look at this, would you eat it? It was a pureed diet with thickened liquids. 
And she made me taste it. And it was so bad, so absolutely atrociously bad. And I said, OK, I got it. So I talked to her about it. I said, the reason they put you on this is they're worried about you getting pneumonia, aspirating. But are you willing to take the risk? And she said, yes. And I talked to the family about it. I talked to her. I talked to the, house, the nursing home staff. They made me sign something to say we're willing to take the risk, and I signed it. We put on a chopped diet. We're not going to make a big pieces of steak, but on a chopped diet, she had better quality of life, and she was happier. And so, yes, it is a risk. Are you willing to take it? You have to ask the patient. Is there enough time to eat? Is the patient being fed? Are they getting enough help being fed? Some older patients, they can eat, they can swallow. It just takes a very long time. The staff at the hospitals and nursing homes, they have to get onto the next and the next and the next. So they're going to be rushing. That patient's not going to get enough to eat. But if somebody is willing to sit there and spend a lot of time, they can get the intake. Is this a medication side effect? We always have to worry about that. And then some patients, they'll do well with dietary supplements. I personally hate them. They're really, really sweet, you know, the Ensure and Boost and all of those. But some people love them. They come in liquid, they come in pudding form. So uh, make sure you find something that uh, your family member likes. But those can be very helpful as well. Medications are a big issue. Adverse drug events, very common and often missed. There's, uh, I think I did a lecture on medications, so you guys have heard that. But there's actually a list of medications that are dangerous in older people. We never say never, because sometimes you absolutely have to use them. But we always say try and find an alternative if it's on the list. It's called the Beers Criteria. It's, it's not, it has nothing to do with beer. It's a Dr. Beers who created the criteria. And they're revised every few years, and it's a, the list is getting longer and longer of things that should be avoided, if possible, in old age. Medications can cause delirium or confusion, falls, functional decline, and older people at higher risk. So we get into this vicious cycle of medication, side effect, getting treated by another medication, another side effect, another medication, more and more and more. So solution is monitoring drug levels, avoiding these high-risk drugs, simplifying the regimen. Sometimes we stop medications, and guess what? The patient gets much, much better. So many of these can be prevented. We really need to try. Dementia, it's kind of a catch-22, because the patients with dementia are at highest risk for hospital complications and for poor outcomes. Often, we have to really consider the risks and benefits before making the decision to hospitalize. So I really try hard. I talk to the family. Often, the patients are not able to consent because they don't have capacity. But I often talk to the family to say, yes, this patient is really sick, but I'm worried about putting them in the hospital. Maybe we should try and keep them home and see what happens. And again, it depends a little bit on the family and the risks and the benefits. But if possible, I try and keep them out, because they do very badly. Very confusing place for a person who already has dementia. So again, reviewing goals of care. If the goal is comfort, what should we do? Depression is seen in almost 40% of hospitalized elders. So even if they don't have it before, they're going to have it now. So again, something to consider. So we need to evaluate these patients very early for delirium or confusion, try and prevent it. I'll talk about that in, a, I think, the next slide. Monitor the medications. Consider antidepressants. Sometimes they can be very helpful. And family is invaluable for these types of patients. Frequent reorientation, reminding mom or dad. Today is Saturday. This is today's date. It's morning, night, whatever it is. Reassuring people. Mom, you're in the hospital. It's OK, I'm right here. They're going to do this to you now. They're going to take you for an x-ray, explaining it over and over sometimes, if necessary. And then help with feeding and just safety to make sure they don't get out of bed or do something that's unsafe. So what is delirium? I've mentioned it a few times before this. This is an acute confusional state that fluctuates. 
This comes on over hours to days. This is not like dementia. Alzheimer's disease does not come on in hours to days. It takes months to years to come on. Delirium is sudden onset. It's usually because somebody is acutely ill. These patients have very poor attention to the point that you may not even be able to have a conversation with them. They cannot pay attention long enough to get out a sentence. And they have an altered consciousness. What does this mean? They could be hyper alert and agitated or asleep and you can't wake them up all day. And they can go back and forth between these two states. 30 to 50 percent of people over the age of 70 who are in the hospital will have delirium of varying severity. So sometimes it's really mild and people may even miss it. Sometimes it's so obvious it's in your face. But it's very, very common. It's, a, it's contributed to by many different factors. Your acute illness, your medications, the strange environment, pain, constipation, sleep disorders, all of these things can contribute to making delirium worse or even causing it. And it's associated with bad outcomes. Patients with delirium end up staying longer in the hospital, they have a higher mortality, and they have more functional disability and decline, which could end up being permanent, actually. So it's really important to pick this up early. We do have ways of identifying this. Just like Alzheimer's disease can be missed by doctors, this will be missed if it's not looked for. So we're trying to train people to say, for people over a certain age, we should be screening for this and checking to see whether we think they have some level of delirium. And prevention is definitely possible. They have programs that specifically try and prevent delirium. Virginia talked about this. I like the support staff and administrative staff. I like that one. There are a lot of bad bugs out there and the hospital, unfortunately, is a breeding ground for them. So good hand washing is really the key. We're really trying to do education to the staff for this. They are the ones who transmit a lot of the bugs. But even if you're family and you're visiting the person, make sure you're washing your hands constantly before touching other things. The other thing to really stress is please don't visit the hospital if you're sick. Right now, right now, we have four nursing homes in town that have flu outbreaks. Often, sometimes brought in by staff, but often brought in by families. It's really better to stay out, because what's simple for you and me, may, you know, you get flu, yes, it's not, you get sick, you're in bed for a few days, it can actually kill older people. So often when there's a flu outbreak, it's like, wow, we now have five openings. What does that mean? Five people on that floor died. So even our, our physicians and our trainees, we tell them, because physicians are notorious for this, I'm going to tough it out, I'm going to work when I'm sick. And I've got to say, I've done it too. But since I've been in geriatrics, I don't go in. I at least work from home, so I'm not going to make other people sick. I should probably not work at all, right? <laughs> but at least I don't get other people sick. So we have to warn our trainees, if you're sick, especially if you have something like the flu, Please do not come in, you will start an outbreak. So new models of care. There's this thing called the ACE unit, acute care for elders. Many of the hospitals on the mainland have it. They have an environment, they create this environment that promotes mobility and orientation. And they have this interprofessional team of staff who basically are trying to do things to make the person not get delirium, not get pressure ulcers, things like that. There's early social work intervention to plan for what's going to happen at discharge, and medications are reviewed very, very carefully. Very good outcomes with this model. Improved function, improved satisfaction, re even reduced cost. So that's why we're trying to tell people, you know, the hospitals, this actually reduces cost. You have to put out an, a little outlay of money, but in the end it will prevent a lot of a uh, waste of money, and still, we, have, we don't have any ACE units in Hawaii yet, maybe in the future. Other models of care, the Hospital Elder Life Program, which is also called HELP, it's actually focused on delirium, that's that acute confusional state, by managing six factors, 
looking at cognitive impairment, sleep deprivation, immobility, vision impairment, hearing impairment, and dehydration. If you take care of these six factors, the rates of delirium are dramatically reduced. Surgical co-management, that actually does exist in some of the hospitals here, particularly for hip fractures. Many hip fractures are in older people, and often they will develop a delirium and post-operative complications. So they have a geriatrician team up with the orthopedic surgeon, and they co-manage. The, sur the surgeon does the surgery, and then the geriatrician does all the other stuff to try and keep those complications at a minimum. And then the last one is the most innovative and the best program, I think, is the hospital in-home program. Unfortunately, the only place that has that is actually the VA. And of course, it's only for certain types of hospitalizations. You can't do, if somebody is having a heart attack or heart rhythm problems, you can't manage that at home. But for certain things, people who need long-term antibiotics or certain other wound care or things like that, the patient stays at home and the hospital comes to them. So they have nursing come in two, three times a day, or other people come in two, three times a day. Good savings and better outcomes and better satisfaction. It's a win-win-win situation. So I'm hoping more of these programs will spring up. At discharge, we always have to wonder, does the patient need a caregiver? Do they need equipment? Do they need a home safety evaluation to see if there are fall hazards? If it's a discharge to rehab or a nursing home, for how long? What is the goal? Is the ultimate goal to get home? Then the plan is different. We need good communication between the healthcare professionals. And I think we don't do a good job with this. We need to do a better job making family understand medications, the care needs, and even the prognosis to let them know what are the odds of your family member getting back to where they, where they were before? What is it going to take? Or is it not possible? Sometimes those hard decisions need to be made and we need to communicate that. For rehab, physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, all of these are really critical and can really change the person's functioning and make them more independent. So we try and get that early and for as long as possible. Rehab hospital is possible, but many older people won't qualify because you need to be able to tolerate at least three hours of therapy per day. And some older people just don't have enough stamina for that long. So often it's done in the skilled nursing facility. Most older people actually go to the SNF for rehab. Outpatient rehab is wonderful if the person can, and then home rehab as well. So in summary then, Hospitalization can be a crossroad for older people. You always have to weigh the risks and the benefits. Complications can be prevented with good, with good care. We need to keep the patient's preferences in mind and provide good rehab for functional independence. This is what an older person faces in the hospital. This is an obstacle course. <laughs> Think about how you or I would be able to get over this, right? Not very easily. Lots of obstacles in their way. We want to try and pull down some of those barriers if we can, and get them out as quickly as possible so they don't trip over the next obstacle. So, I'm following Virginia's instructions, always end with a joke. My doctor told me to avoid any unnecessary stress, so I didn't open his bill. <laughs> I would say, don't open that hospital bill. Have you seen that? It's shocking how much hospitals cost. Now I know why they call it ICU. <laughs> so with that, I'll end, and I'll see if anyone has any questions. Thank you so much for your attention. <laughs>